All right, in the final part of lesson four, we're going to look at a different kind of hypothesis test. It's called a Chi-Sphere test. And what it does is it helps us look for things like independence between two different variables. Like, for example, one event is discrimination, and the other event is the race of applicants for a job. There's this firm that has an office in a rural southern town. After seeing a local news report that questions the hiring practices of this office, you constructed the following pivot table to determine if discrimination against Black applicants is occurring at this office. So at the 5% level of significance, you want to test whether or not discrimination against Black applicants is occurring. If discrimination is occurring at the office, we'd expect there to be a dependency between the event hired and the event race of applicant. If there is no discrimination, we'd expect hired and race of applicant to be independent. What that means is the observed frequencies from our pivot table, which we computed in the third part of lesson one, we would see very little differences between what we observe and what we expect. So if the differences between observed frequencies and expected frequencies are small, then we would have evidence of independence. Resulting test statistic would be close to zero. The null hypothesis of independence test assumes that the events are independent. The alternative hypothesis is the opposite, dependent. And one way to remember that is if the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies are identical, we'd have independence. If the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies are different, we'd have dependence. Under random sampling, the probability that the observed frequencies equal their corresponding expected frequencies, well, that's zero, right? So we have to allow for some play. And so what we're looking for is significant differences beyond a reasonable doubt. And when you say beyond a reasonable doubt, you're talking about a hump of a distribution, right? You're talking about beyond a reasonable doubt. So if the, if the differences between expected frequencies and observed frequencies um, are close to zero, then we expect this statistic to be close to zero. As those differences get bigger and bigger and bigger, the test statistic would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the question is, is that significant? Well, these are upper tail tests. This purple area is significant. So the differences between the observed frequencies and their effective expected frequencies would have to be large enough to push the test statistic out to this purple region. And then we would conclude that collectively, the differences are significant. So that's the intuition behind this test. So I'm gonna copy both tables all the way down to p-value and the word at. I'm gonna copy all that. I'm gonna paste it as match destination formatting. And I'm doing this in worksheet L4 of the Excel file that I named or saved as lesson underscore unit four underscore my last name. Now I'm gonna delete these and I'm gonna delete that. And the observed frequencies are in green. So we'll change them to green and we'll change the expected frequencies to red. This is the expected frequency of hired and white. So how do we calculate intersections. Remember, if these were probabilities, we'd do what? We'd multiply the probability of white times the probability hired, right? But these are frequencies, so we multiply the two uh, marginal frequencies, and then we're going to go ahead and divide by the overall total. So this is the expected frequency, and notice it's pretty close to 78. We need four decimal places, so 
Okay, now this is the event white and not hired. So if these were probabilities, we would multiply the marginal probability of white times the marginal probability of not hired, right? But these are frequencies, right? And then we're gonna divide by the 176. Black and hired frequency. So we're gonna have to just multiply them and then divide by the overall total. The same thing for the last category. Now we've known, we know we've done it right if this row actually adds up to 108. This row actually adds up to 68. This column adds up to 123, right? That column adds up to 53. Go ahead and enter this information in. Press enter. Looks like we're doing it right, correct? I'm gonna have to move this down. We had to calculate the differences in each of these, right? We had to calculate this difference, we had to calculate this difference, we had to calculate this difference, and we had to calculate that difference, right? But what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna calculate the square difference. So we have the observed frequency, right? Minus is expected frequency squared. So you can think of this as kind of like when we're, we're calculating the variance, right? We take the observed value minus the sample mean, and then we square that, right? And then we sum that. Then we divide it by something, right? That's the kind of intuition here. But the equation says we have to divide the square deviation by the expected frequency. So B9 enters this calculation twice. B3 enters it once. Right, so we have a square deviation divided by the expected frequency. And then the other ones are easy. So we're going to shrink the number of decimal places down to four. And then I'm going to drag this across and down, right? Square deviations from the expected value divided by the expected value. Now the test statistic is just the sum of these. And the test statistic is 0.7247. It's positive. Why is the test statistic positive? Because this is not equal to 78. This is not equal to 30. This is not equal to 45. This is not equal to 23, right? The probability that these equal their counterparts appear is zero, right? So we're going to get differences. We should expect four differences. Why? Because the probability that all four of these expected frequencies equal their respective observed frequencies, well, that is zero, right? These differences aren't very big, are they? This is pretty close to 78. This is pretty close to 30. This is pretty close to 45. And this is pretty close to 23. So collectively, these differences aren't very big, which is why test statistic is less than one. Now, the degrees of freedom of an independence test involving a pivot table is the number of rows. We have two rows here, right? White, black, minus one, times the number of columns. Two, hired, not hired. Two minus one is one, and two minus one is one, and one times one is one, right? So let's go back to our statdistributions.com calculator here. Our degrees of freedom are one. So this kind of looks like the exponential distribution, right? Our test statistic is 0.7247. So the value along the number line We'll call it 0.725, degrees of freedom one. And then our p-value is to the right of 0.725. Remember, independence tests are always upper tail tests. So the p-value should be close to 0.395. Now we want four decimal place accuracy, right? So what we have to do is we have to use chi 
square dot. Now, are we doing dot dist or are we doing dot inv? We're going to do dot dist because we're going to feed this function a number on the number line. The number on the number line is 0.725. In Excel case, 0.7247, right? And then the degrees of freedom, one. Chi-square test statistics are associated with upper tail test. So this, typing this would give us the left tail probability, right? That'd give us this white area. But since chi-square test statistics are associated with upper tail test, Excel has done something really cool. They've created a right tail chi square dot dist formula. And all you have to feed it is the number on the number line, which is 0.725 and the degrees of freedom, that's it. And you get the, the area under the distribution to right of the test statistic, which is 0.3946. That's our p-value. StatDistributions.com has it at 0.395, right? Because if we go to three decimal places, we get 0.395. But we want four decimal place accuracy. So let's go back to my math. The p-value is 0.3946. The degrees of freedom is 1. And the test statistic is 0.7247. Now, at 5% significance, so we're choosing a 5% significance level, test statistic and the p-value go together. The significance level and the critical value go together. The significance level in my problem is 5% or 0 0.05. The critical value is the number on the number line that has an area under the distribution that corresponds to an area under the distribution that is to the right of the critical value, right? So let's go back to statsdistributions.com. I'm going to change this up here to 0 0.05, right? So this area here is 0 0.05. And the number in the number line is 3.838, right? So this would be the critical value to that significance level of 0 0.05. Excel has a function for you, chi square dot inverse. And then again, chi square test or upper tail. So Excel's giving you this RT version of it, right? Right tail version of it. Now the probability, we're feeding this the probability value because it's the dot inverse function. And then the degrees of freedom, which were one. And we get something close to 3.838. We get 0.341. Okay, so let's go back to my math. Our critical value is larger than the test statistic. The test statistic is the collective differences of the observed frequencies and the respective expected frequencies. Okay, so let's open up statsdistributions.com. This purple area is our significance, right? If there are no differences between what we observe and what we expect, the Casper test statistic would be zero. But that's not the case, right? The test statistic is not zero. It's slightly positive. So the test statistic is right here. It's really close to zero. Why is it so close to zero? Again, it's close to zero because this is pretty close to what we expect. This is pretty close to what we expect. This is pretty close to what we expect. And this is pretty close to what we expect. So those collective differences are very, very small, which is why the chi-square test statistic ends up being close to zero. If it's under the white area, we say the differences are insignificant. If the chi-square test statistic were, say, 7.778, the chi-square test statistic would be under the purple area, which is the significance, right? And 
So in that case, we would say those collective differences are significant. But we have we have the opposite situation, right? Our test, my test statistic is under the white area. So we have evidence in support of what? The null hypothesis. So thus we cannot reject the null. If the test statistic were up here, 6.364, we would reject the null, right? Because our differences are very large. If the differences are very large, we have dependence. And if we have dependence, we might have discrimination, right? Differences, dependence, discrimination. Thus, we cannot reject the null hypothesis and being hired in the race of applicant, we can't say are independent. We can say the two things appear to be independent. The reason why we say appear to be independent is because we can't accept a null hypothesis. We can say we cannot reject it, but we cannot say we accept it. You can think accept, but you say cannot reject. And for that reason, we say appear to be independent instead of saying independent.